You probably don't recognize his name, but Mike Lazaridis has had a defining impact on your life. From an early age, it was clear that Mike was something of an electronics wizard. By the time he turned four, he was building his own record player out of Legos and rubber bands. In high school, when his teachers had broken TVs, they called Mike to fix them. In his spare time, he built a computer and designed a better buzzer for high school quiz bowl teams, which ended up paying for his first year of college. Just months before finishing his electrical engineering degree, Mike did what so many great entrepreneurs of his era would do. He dropped out of college. It was time for this son of immigrants to make his mark on the world. Mike's first success came when he patented a device for reading the barcodes on movie film, which was so useful in Hollywood that it won an Emmy and an Oscar for technical achievement. That was small potatoes compared to his next big invention, which made his firm the fastest growing company on the planet. Mike's flagship device quickly attracted a cult following, with loyal customers ranging from Bill Gates to Christina Aguilera. Oprah Winfrey gushed, It's literally changed my life. I cannot live without this. When he arrived at the White House, President Obama refused to relinquish his to the Secret Service. Mike Lazaridis dreamed up the idea for the BlackBerry as a wireless communication device for sending and receiving emails. As of the summer of 2009, it accounted for nearly half of the U.S. smartphone market. By 2014, its market share had plummeted to less than 1%. When a company takes a nosedive like that, we can never pinpoint a single cause of its downfall, so we tend to anthropomorphize it. BlackBerry failed to adapt. Yet, adapting to a changing environment isn't something a company does. It's something people do in the multitude of decisions they make every day. As the co-founder, president, and co-CEO, Mike was in charge of all the technical and product decisions on the BlackBerry. Although his thinking may have been the spark that ignited the smartphone revolution, his struggles with rethinking ended up sucking the oxygen out of his company and virtually extinguishing his invention. Where did he go wrong? Most of us take pride in our knowledge and expertise and in staying true to our beliefs and opinions. That makes sense in a stable world where we get rewarded for having conviction in our ideas. The problem is that we live in a rapidly changing world where we need to spend as much time rethinking as we do thinking. Rethinking is a skill set, but it's also a mindset. We already have many of the mental tools we need. We just have to remember to get them out of the shed and remove the rest. With advances in access to information and technology, knowledge isn't just increasing. It's increasing at an increasing rate. In 2011, you consumed about five times as much information per day as you would have just a quarter century earlier. As of 1950, it took about 50 years for knowledge and medicine to double. By 1980, medical knowledge was doubling every seven years. And by 2010, it was doubling in half that time. The accelerating pace of change means that we need to question our beliefs more readily than ever before. This is not an easy task. As we sit with our beliefs, they tend to become more extreme and more entrenched. I mean, I'm still struggling to accept that Pluto may not be a planet. In education, after revelations in history and revolutions in science, it often takes years for a curriculum to be updated and textbooks to be revised. Researchers have recently discovered that we need to rethink widely accepted assumptions about subjects such as Cleopatra's roots, her father was Greek, not Egyptian, and her mother's identity is unknown, the appearance of dinosaurs. Paleontologists now think some tyrannosaurs had colorful feathers on their backs. And what's required for sight. Blind people have actually trained themselves in a version of seeing. Sound waves can activate the visual cortex and create representations in the mind's eye, much like how echolocation helps bats navigate in the dark. For my part, I'd assume the phrase, blowing smoke up your arse, came from people gifting cigars to someone they wanted to impress, so you can imagine how intrigued I was when my wife told me its real origin. In the 1700s, it was common practice to revive drowning victims with tobacco enemas, literally blowing smoke up their behinds. Only later did they learn that it was toxic to the cardiac system. Vintage records, classic cars, and antique clocks might be valuable collectibles, but outdated facts are mental fossils that are best abandoned. We're swift to recognize when other people need to think again. We question the judgment of experts whenever we seek out a second opinion on a medical diagnosis. Unfortunately, when it comes to our own knowledge and opinions, we often favor feeling right over being right. In everyday life, we make many diagnoses of our own, 
ranging from whom we hire to whom we marry. We need to develop the habit of forming our own second opinions.